Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nature Drawing. My name is James Sisti. I'm a professional artist, a wilderness guide, and today I have the privilege of being your instructor. This class is pretty much a, a sample of what we do with Hike and Draw. Uh, we're going to be talking about what nature, what nature drawing is. We're going to discuss our goals, go over the kind of kit we use in the field, and then we'll get started with our uh, exercises. We're going to do a warm-up exercise using the first reference photo, which is of a leaf. Uh, the second thing we're going to do is a type of landscape drawing exercise. And then we're going to finish off with a memory game, and that's going to be a nature journaling exercise. So plenty of activity. We're going to cram into 90 minutes here. So let's get rolling. First and foremost, what is our goal when we do nature drawing? Uh, basically, don't consider this as something that would be um, like only an at-home activity. I want you to take all the things you've learned today and bring them out into nature with you the next time you're hiking, the next time you're in your garden, or even in your own backyard. It's a great opportunity to connect with nature and to uh, document your observations in a very creative way. And the best thing about that is that you get an opportunity to share what you learn with other people. And it's a very positive habit to keep up, especially if you're gonna be spending a lot of time uh, at home or uh, if, if one of your New Year's resolutions is to do more hiking. So when I go out into the field, I like to keep it simple. With my basic kit, these are the things that I will always use no matter what, my sketchbook or my nature journal, uh, a pencil and a fountain pen. That's all I use because that's the simplest way for me to enjoy a, uh, a productive outing. If I'm gonna make it a very intentional outing where I'm gonna be painting specifically, then I'll build more uh, paints into my kit. But you don't want to be carrying around too much. You want to keep it simple. So that's why this is such an accessible hobby, because the bare minimum you need is some paper, pencil, and maybe a pen. And that's it. All right. So let's continue. All right. And this is something that you want to make personal. If you're interested in something very specific, whether it's birds or insects, fossils, volcanoes, whatever, that's your, that's going to be your focus. So that's a, that's a great opportunity to dive in and learn more about the things that interest you specifically. Um, I also encourage you to pick up different types of artifacts that you find on the trail, whether that's leaves or little animal bones or um, fruits, things like that. Always good to practice with three-dimensional objects. So uh, just make sure you're not hurting anything when you're, when you're collecting samples. So for our next exercise, our first exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to warm up using the first reference photo. And I'm going to teach you the drawing system that we do here. And this is an example of, um, of our system, right? We have a reference photo. And it's of a dried up cherry leaf. It's the winter time. So most of the leaves look like this now, uh, unless it's an evergreen species. And uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to share my top down camera now. <laughs> All right. So here is my top down camera. Perfect. Okay. So I have my regular eight by 10 piece of paper and all I'm going to do is fold it in half, just like this. I like to utilize every square inch of the paper so that it's not a waste. And I also like to make sure that everything kind of correlates into an overarching narrative, right? So here we have our sheet of paper. The first thing I'm gonna have you do, we're all gonna draw together now, is we're going to start by creating a margin. Okay, this is called squaring off the page. And it's always the first step for me when I'm doing drawings, especially in the field, because it creates a nice neat space for me to do my drawing especially if I want to divide a page up into different sections, but it also creates an area for me to keep notes. And I usually like to keep them on the margins here. So we started off by just folding our page in half and making a rectangle. Now let's take a look at the reference photo again together. And I want to show you an idea here. Now I've been teaching this concept of drawing architecture, right? We're not, we're not just making a drawing, we're constructing a drawing. And this is a step-by-step -step process that anybody can do. So we're gonna look and we're going to consider this object as a whole. And the first consideration we're gonna make is its dimensions, right? So 
how would we do that? Well, first and foremost, what I'm going to do is I am going to make a, a sort of guess or measurement. Okay, so I'm gonna look and see how wide the object is. And I'm just gonna make two little tick marks here, two little dots, and then I'm gonna note how long the object is. Okay, roughly, roughly this length. It doesn't have to be perfect, just a guess is fine. Now, the reason why I picked this object is because it's all dried out, it's all curled up, and it's got a lot of character. So that's why. Um, so we have this diamond that consists of four little dot, dots, and this is our starting point. Now, where do we go from here? When working with leaves specifically, one of the things I like to do is I like to look at how the base connects to the petiole. And the petiole is that little stem. Okay, that's, the, that's sort of like a, uh, if you ever watched a, a development of a leaf bud, over time, it kind of comes out like a lipstick tube and then it unfurls into a leaf. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a series of dots just like this. And what I'm going to notice here is the, how symmetrical the base is. The base of the leaf is the part that meets with the petiole, okay? So not all leaves have symmetrical bases, but this particular leaf, I believe it's a type of, I, I can't say if it's an American cherry, it might be a, a Kwanzan cherry or some other type of botanical variation of the species. But it's got a very interesting margin and it kind of looks like a sawtooth. Now that's something that's very characteristic of the cherry. And we're gonna look, and as we trace our way around, cause we're going to be putting these dots down, plotting them like coordinates. And I mentioned the architect thing earlier. We're gonna think like architects. So this is like our map or our blueprint for the drawing, okay? So as we continue, you're gonna notice that there's a really long narrow tip to this leaf here. And what's characteristic of these types of leaves, cherry tree, cherry leaves in particular, is that they develop this sort of drip tip because they don't want to collect a lot of moisture on the surface of the leaf, right? They wanna make sure they shed as much water off the leaf as possible because they don't want any of that mold or anything growing there. It reduces their capacity to perform photosynthesis. So that's an interesting little tidbit about cherry leaves in case you didn't know that. So our goal here was just to kind of size up and measure a relatively accurate um, proportion for our cherry leaf. And we got the outside all figured, right? And I'm not making any lines yet because this is, again, this is like our planning phase. We haven't really technically started to draw. Here's why. At this point, it's the safest time to make edits, right? So for example, I had originally estimated the leaf would be about this long, but it's a little bit longer than I anticipated. So I made that edit by just simply extending the leaf past the little mark that I made earlier. In fact, it's also a little bit more narrow at the tip. So for me, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to course correct here and make it a little bit more narrow. And I have my kneaded eraser, my gray kneaded eraser. And I'm just gonna go ahead and remove the excess so that I have a clearer picture, okay? And the leaf curls very nicely, it's very eloquent, but it's also straighter than I put it. So what I'm going to do is course correct again. And I'm just going to follow that nice, gentle, natural curl. Okay, just like that. And I could always go in there and remove the excess material. Okay, so now I feel better about the tip, but if I look towards the top, there's so much more drama that I didn't capture in this leaf that I would like to. So I'm just going to continue by widening the leaf a little bit because I really want to get this curl, this curve that's happening on the top to be more accentuated. So I'm just going to move my, my line over here, okay? And this is what I like to call active editing, right? I'm not really concerned about making mistakes or anything like that because again i'm thinking like an architect and if this is a blueprint then what i'm considering are measurements okay so if the measurement is something that needs to be edited you can edit it twice you could edit it three times it doesn't matter see if we want to bring it in all you have to do is come up with a middle ground just like that 
And now if you pause and you look, you have now three options that are going to give you the best path forward, okay? So all you need to do at this point is select the best path forward by removing the excess line uh, dots that you put down earlier, okay? And now you're dealing with something that not only looks more accurate, but it feels better because now you can move forward confidently knowing that the edits you're making are the right uh, consideration here, okay? So now what do we do that, now that we have all these dots on the paper, what do we do with them? So I don't wanna say connect them, like we're gonna do a connect the dots game in a magazine. Instead, we're gonna use these as guidelines. And I really wanna drive home the point that it is not a mandatory um, step in this technique to trace the dots. So just like I made the edits earlier, I can go ahead and widen the base of the leaf a little bit. I can add some line weight, which we'll talk about in a little bit to add some more drama, more dramatic lighting, okay? But I like starting at a very simple part and that's the pitial, okay? And that's going to be my solid line work. And we're also going to be dealing with that, that serrated sawtoothed kind of margin too, remember that? So what we're going to do there is we're going to continue just like we did earlier, keeping our eye on the reference. That's a really important thing to do. And we can go ahead and start by creating this sawtooth, just like that. And as you can see, this part of the leaf is curled up a little bit. So it's going to change a little bit in the angle, right? So you're gonna see that the teeth look longer and more accentuated right around here. Okay. And then as the leaf curls back in on itself, those saw teeth are gonna get smaller, less dramatic. Okay, and that's because again, we're looking at something that is folding and it's curling in on itself. So like over here, the teeth are much smaller, much, le much less accentuated. And then once we get to about this point here, they get bigger before curling back in on themselves again. Okay, now over here, it's gonna kind of invert a little. So we have a section here where now the teeth are pointing downwards, just like that until you can barely even notice them anymore towards the tip. And then the top of the tip here is going to be perfectly flat because that is technically the underside of the leaf. Okay, now as we continue from this portion here, now our teeth are facing a totally different direction. And this is a great exercise for practicing your observation skills because who would think to spend this much time looking at the direction in which the teeth of a leaf grow, am I right? That's kind of the beauty of this practice is that it causes you to look at things and notice things that you normally would never even think to notice. Okay, notice how at the bottom of the leaf, we're seeing much less tooth and it's because probably the leaf is curling downward underneath itself a little bit, and this is a flat edge. But then as it comes up on this side, it gives you a little peak of the underside of the leaf here. And now we're gonna start to see towards the base over here, just a couple of more slight serrated edges before it becomes almost completely flat again. Okay, quite a journey around a small, simple leaf. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create that mid rib that travels down the center horizontally. And for those of for everybody who's drawing along, don't feel like you need to rush to try to keep up. Draw at your pace. Feel free to just watch too, because I am recording this. And that way we'll be able to, um, together, we can, we can draw in tandem or you can watch later and draw at your convenience. Okay, so here's the midrib that travels down the center of the leaf here. And don't make it perfectly straight. It's going to need a little bit of curvature. 
because again, we're drawing a subject that is dried up in curling. And you're going to notice that there is a, a venal pattern, okay, that comes through starting at the midrib. And whenever you see that, okay, that's called uh, a pinnate, pinnately uh, veined leaf. Okay, now there are other types of leaves that are called palmate, like P-A-L-M, like the palm of your hand. And that means that everything originates from the base and spreads out. And a good example of a palmate, palmately lobed leaf would be a, um, maybe like a London plane or a sycamore type leaf, because it looks more like the palm of your hand. That's how you can remember that. But because we have a midrib and we have veins that are traveling down the center like this, this is a pinnate. Okay, a little bit of botanical knowledge for you there. And if you're interested in learning more about plants and learning more about the morphology of a tree species, for example, we run a botanical drawing class. And it's now one of our weekend classes. It moved from being a weeknight class. So uh, if you have some time on the weekends, you want to try something different, want to learn a little bit, have some more science in your art or vice versa, some more art in your science, then that's a great class for you. Okay, so I'm just noticing how they're alternating too. These veins are alternating. They're not completely opposite from each other. And that varies per leaf. I don't think every leaf on the tree will look like that, but this particular specimen, I just wanna make sure that I'm careful enough to um, acknowledge that observation in my drawing, just like that. Okay, so now that we have the subject sketched out, what we can do now is I mentioned um, earlier this, this concept of line weight. And here's what I mean. Since we're, since we're looking at a leaf that is resting on a flat surface, there's going to be a shadow that this leaf casts on that surface. And the way I can really help to accentuate that shadow isn't by just scribbling in darkness around the leaf. Instead, what I can do is I can look and see where the shadow is the most dramatic, and I can add a thicker line to that edge, just like here. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us the illusion of a shadow, especially over here too, where the leaf is curling in on itself. And you don't wanna do this all the way around the leaf because then that will lose the effect. But just by making the line a little bit thicker, even in the center in that midrib there, we can do that too. It kind of gives it a little bit more drama. Okay, see how that works? And we can go ahead now at this point and consider also the different things about this leaf that we're noticing, right? So let's say for example, okay, we have this margin here. I'd mentioned earlier adding notes to, this, to these margins. Um, the first thing I usually like to add is the date. Okay, so I'll do today's date, which is the 9th of January, brand new year. Okay, and then the second piece of information I'm going to add is naming the subject. What is this, right? So I know that this is a cherry leaf. And I mentioned that I believed it to be not a native cherry species, but more of a, a botanical cherry species, something you'd find in a garden, like an ornamental garden, uh, where you see beautiful, uh, exotic, tropical plants. So I'm not sure what species, but I'm sure that it is a, a cherry. So that's why I wrote that very broad term cherry leaf. Now we can also do some writing next to our drawing. Okay, like for example, if I wanted to measure this leaf and include some, some more notes about it, I can go ahead and say, all right, this is a probably two inch leaf. Okay, and I'm trying to, do the metric system more because <laughs> I know we have a lot of folks from uh, overseas and it's actually that what they use in, in scientific work, they, they do use the metric system. So I got to get better at that. But let's say, for example, this is a bigger leaf. It's about two inches 
by 4.5 inches. And I don't know the conversion into centimeters, so don't test me. Uh, but I'll try to learn uh, the metric system a little bit better for future classes. Okay, so we have some data. Okay, we have some measurements, but what's the texture? Let's, let's write down some notes that aren't necessarily visible in our sketch here. Maybe the texture, since it's uh, a dead leaf, is, um, let's say it is a, first of all, we don't have any color here. So let's say it's brownish, brown and yellow. Paper-like texture. Okay, and for certain species, maybe you picked up, let's say, for example, a different nature object, maybe you picked up a hickory nut, which is very aromatic, it has a very distinct smell to it, adding things that you can't necessarily um, draw, like smells or sounds, that's where another handy thing for, uh, for, that's another handy way to capture those is with your notes. So uh, obviously it's a cherry leaf, it smells like a leaf. Um, but for example, if it was something more aromatic, you'd be able to write it. Like if you were drawing a flower, what does the flower smell like? Or if you were drawing a fruit, what does it taste like? You know, these are things that you can add with your notes that don't necessarily come across in a drawing. Okay, so that's our warm up exercise. And now that we're all warmed up, I wanna take all the lessons we learned here and I want to apply them to another mode of nature drawing. Here we are. And this is landscape drawing, right? We have a, a new class that was pretty great last month. It was a, it was a 40, I think 45 people registered for the, the landscape drawing class, but it was a lot of fun. And essentially when we're drawing a landscape together, we're gonna think about this as a larger um, a larger system, right? We're going to keep the core of our system the same, but we're going to consider a few more things. And that's usually under the umbrella of visual hierarchy, which I'll explain in a minute. But the, the mark making we're going to do is going to really help to fill in all of this information that we're seeing here. We have a beautiful mountain with some nice, tall, cedar looking trees, maybe some spruces in there as well and a nice reflection in a lake. Look at all that snow. It's a winter wonderland, okay? This is the second uh, reference photo that I sent everybody. If you didn't get the email, that's okay. It's in the chat. You can download it directly in the chat. And um, I'll show you how to set up a landscape drawing in just a second. Okay, so. If also, if you didn't get the reference photo, you can take a screenshot of this image and work from that as well. Okay. All right, and if you need more time to take the screenshot, just hit me up in the chat. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take the same piece of paper that I already folded in half. And now I'm going to use this side, waste not. And the second thing I'm going to do is square off the page using a rectangular margin. Okay, the lines don't have to be perfect. It's like a nice container. Everything within this container is what you're responsible for as the artist. Okay, so we have our rectangle here and this is also a measuring tool. And I'll explain how this rectangle is a measuring tool in just a second. So considering, again, the reference photo that we have here, okay, we're going to, there we go, we're going to now consider how everything is oriented within this rectangle, okay? So starting from the top, okay, the top, let's go here, the top left corner you're gonna see and notice how the mountain sort of slopes gently down from this point right here. What I'm going to have you do is try to find that point and mark it on your rectangle using just a little dot or a dash. Okay, if you couldn't tell at this point, I'm a big fan of mark making. 
And again, we're gonna think like architects because this is going to help us construct our drawing. So you're gonna put a mark here for the top of this mountain. And then you're gonna travel all the way down in a straight line to the bottom of this mountain and you're gonna make another dash. Okay, so this is going to be the relative size. It doesn't have to be the exact size, but relative is good enough. The relative size of what that mountain is going to be in your drawing. Because this is where the mountain meets the ground. Okay, in the ground, this is probably a frozen pond here with about two or three feet of snow on it. And it's going to make a straight line here and then another dash. So you're gonna have a dash for the top of the mountain, for the bottom of the mountain, and for the where the land meets the water. Okay, and it's much shorter. So if you think about it, this space is going to be larger than this space. Okay, and don't worry about the reflections just yet. Okay, everywhere from here down is going to be water. We'll get to that in a minute. Now let's consider also how that works on the right hand side. Okay, if we look in the upper right hand corner here, right, there's a lot happening. <laughs> okay, but let's travel over a little bit towards the middle of the page here and we're going to start to see where the tree line recedes a little bit because we have this perspective. This is a great place to make a mark. Okay, so we're going to have another mark right around here because this is where the tree line breaks and it kind of recedes into the background. All right. And we're going to travel over here to the extreme right of the page and we're going to see how tall the tree is, right? So if this is the bottom of the tree, what do we do? Well, let's consider this. If we have two dashes for the top of the mountain and the bottom of the mountain, we'll have two dashes, one for the top of the tree and one for the bottom of the tree. Okay, and we're going to keep that on the right hand side. Again, you're going to use this margin as a measuring tool. And if you were to consider the bottom of this tree to the bottom of the mountain, it's pretty much a straight line across the page. Okay. Which could be considered like a, a kind of baseline. Now, everything from here down is snow. All right. So, what we could do, see how you have this nice sort of horseshoe shaped lake or pond, okay? Where does this point begin on your page? That's another thing to consider. So if we look at the bottom left-hand corner and walk our way all the way to just about the center, maybe a little bit shorter than the center, we're gonna have a little mark that's going to determine where that land mass begins because it's going to curl its way all the way up and around, just like a horseshoe, okay? And don't worry about the reflections yet, okay? So at this point, we have only one more thing to consider, and that's that mountain in the center here. We don't gotta worry about that right now, okay? Instead, let's just enjoy a little bit of drawing first. So here's all the work we just did, okay? These are our little key points here. Okay, we're thinking like architects. This is gonna be the start of our blueprint. Okay, top of the mountain, bottom of the mountain, that little land mass that juts out. We have where the, the land mass starts for the horseshoe lake. We have the bottom of the tree. Trees grow all the way past this line here, but they start to break here when, where the perspective happens. Okay, so that's what all those little indications mean. How do we turn this into a drawing? So what I'm going to do, is I'm going to consider also how I would walk around this picture, right? And I'm gonna use dots to kind of indicate the coordinates, right? The blueprints. So I'm gonna start here at the base of the mountain and I'm gonna walk through that tall hedge line that you're seeing all frosted with snow. And you got those baby little trees in there, okay? And I'm gonna notice that the bottom of the mountain has a nice gentle slope. So what I'm doing is right now, I'm just establishing what the bottom, the bottom of the mountain is, and it's extending into that brush line until it hits the trees right around here, okay? So from the top now, I have a place to land, which is somewhere around here. So I'm gonna take my pencil 
and I'm going to create this nice, it's not a steep slope, it's a nice gentle slope. And I'm going to bring that right around here. Okay, so this is our first mountain. Now, what do we have next, right? We have the trees. So if this little area here, okay, this is the gap in the trees. What I'm going to do first, because I'm going to show you how to do the trees in a second, is I'm just going to mark the perspective for how the trees grow. And they kind of look like these triangular shapes or these pyramid-like shapes, very tall and narrow. Okay, and let's say that the tree line ends around here. Okay, so we're filling in a lot of this space so that now we can better determine how the other mountain is going to kind of be built on top of these other features. And lo and behold, we can go ahead and create a nice gentle slope that walks its way up. We got a nice round top mountain, which leaves me to believe that this is possibly an East Coast mountain, maybe in New Hampshire somewhere or Maine. I think somebody told me once that the reason why the East Coast mountains are shorter and rounder is because they're actually older than the West Coast mountains. And we're talking in, in terms of millions and millions of years. So it's, it's an interesting thing to fathom. And it's also, this is a very bare mountain. Like a, um, it's, it doesn't have much, much tree coverage, which could be an indication of maybe a history of logging, which the Dutch and the English were very, very adamant about during their tenure here. And you can also see out west, like out in Washington, little bald patches on the tops of mountains too, where they do, uh, they don't clear cut like they used to. Now they're a little bit better with their land management, but it almost looks like somebody took one of those barber shears and did a little buzz on the top of the mountain, a little bald patch. <laughs> so everything here, I'm just looking at these little rounded uh, sections. I'm just adding my, these are considered notes. These are like my visual notes, these dots here. We have a tree line as well. We have the tops of these uh, trees, these, these shrubby looking trees. They might be birch trees because they're growing so close to the water. Okay. And this is like the, the top half of our landscape here, because what's on the bottom, right? If we start at the bottom of the base of our mountain, and we walk down a little bit, you're going to notice that there is a section here. Okay, here's this land mass that juts out. Okay, and we're going to not be too concerned with the accuracy of this portion because if you think about it, ice melts, it moves. Not important. What is important is just enough that we get just enough of it right that it's convincing. Okay, and I'm walking my way around, walking my way around. Okay, and I'm gonna stop around here because now that we're in the tree line, there's like a, a sort of peninsula that juts out very, very, very uh, subtly. Okay, and they got a little hill here. And all I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating that little horseshoe pond that we saw earlier, that's all. And you can see how from the side, if we look on the, on the right side, there's another little pillow of snow that cascades down just like this. Same thing happens again on this side here, pillow of snow, just like this. And it repeats several times. Okay, and we have our horseshoe lake here, just because we started where we knew the landmass hit the water and we just walked around keeping our eye on the reference, not being too concerned about the reflections or anything like that. And we wound up with our little horseshoe lake. Now at this point, we haven't really drawn anything. This is all planning. And from just the planning itself, you can now see the semblance of this landscape start to manifest. We have the two mountains, we have the little area with the trees, we have the horseshoe lake, it's starting, okay? Now, I do like to consider how we can draw 
using the power of suggestion here. And if you've heard me explain how to draw trees once, you've heard me do it a thousand times. The idea is that you don't have to draw every tree in the forest. You just have to draw a couple of convincing ones and the rest will sort of allow themselves to be imagined as trees by the person who's viewing it, right? So here's a cool little idea, okay? This, this one tree, there's like a little gap in the sky where you see a space between a single tree and then it becomes trees for the rest of the right hand side of the, of the picture. This is a tree that I really wanna pay attention to. In fact, I'm going to push it above the margin here and it's gonna have like a nifty little 3D effect. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pay attention to how the branches are spaced out as I walk down the tree. And I'm going to leave a lot of room to fill in later, rather than try to consider the trunk and all the different branches and everything now, I'm just gonna try to get a profile or an outline of the tree. Okay, and look at how all these little marks are very similar to the dots. These are more dashes than dots, but the complexity of a tree can really be simplified when you consider how much space there is. Okay, that we can fill in. There's a little spot for the trunk here. I'm not gonna draw the whole trunk. Okay, I'm gonna fill in with this foliage here. I'm gonna notice to see how the trunk hits the ground. Just like that. And I'm not gonna draw the whole trunk from top to bottom because that's how we wind up with a pipe cleaner. Okay, so. Here is our basic outline of the spruce tree or of the cedar tree. I can't really tell what it is from this distance. And now we have all this white space. That's good, we want that, okay? We want to be able to utilize that white space to our advantage and we're going to fill it in later. All I'm doing now is I'm adding some texture to the bark of the tree, that's all. The two little spots where I show the trunk of the tree. And that's it. Because if you consider this, right, looking at this as an outsider, as the person who didn't draw this picture, you're going to be able to tell this is a tree. And the reason why you're going to is because it bears all the resemblances of trees. It's a, it's a hierarchical type of, not a hierarchical, um, what is that? What's that word I'm looking for? A, um, a symbolic language that we're speaking here. This is a, a metaphor, basically. And you're going to be amazed at how the, the human mind is able to find patterns and recognize tree from this shape, okay? So the hardest part of this drawing is going to be the forest. And it's not even going to be hard from a technical standpoint. It's just going to be a lot of mark making. So let's step away from the trees from right now. And let's work on these mountains in the background, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the guidelines that I put down, or the guide dots rather. Okay, and I'm gonna notice how different parts of the mountain overlap like this. That's going to give you a nice illusion here. Archetype, that's what I was thinking of. The word earlier was archetype. It's an archetype of a truth, okay. Now we're gonna look and see on the ridge line of this mountain that there are other trees growing there. And the way I draw the trees on the tops of mountains is I kind of think about it like a Richter scale, like when you see an earthquake or a heart monitor, I do that. Cause it gives it the semblance of trees. And then in certain areas, I'll leave perfectly flat like that because there are, are some bald patches, but then I'll go ahead and I'll make some, some more lines just like that and I'll walk my way up and I'll fill in those blank areas with trees. Same thing here, there's gonna be a little patch of trees. So there's my little Richter scale right there. And that's going to follow this line here. Do a couple of rows of them, see how that feels, just like that. Okay, and this is the principle that we're going to apply to our forest earlier. See how all these marks together make sense? Like if we're looking at this, it's clearly a mountain and those are clearly trees on top of the mountain. 
And if the, if the dots from earlier get distracting, you could always erase them or you can keep them. It's all up to you. It's your personal preference. And as we get closer, like let's say, for example, let's, let's draw this mountain here. What I'm going to do is I'll take a piece of scrap paper and put my hand on top of it just so I don't smudge my pencil work by mistake. But I'm going to look and I'm going to notice that there's a tree right on the top of this mountain here. Okay, and to, to us, it's so far away that it's just a little smudge on the top of the mountain. That's fine. We have a couple of bigger ones here. Okay, let's go ahead and draw those in. Just using dots and dashes, we're not even going to use lines to draw those trees. And this is how you get a forest rather than a ton of individual trees. You draw the, the group as a whole, it saves you so much time and work and it actually looks good. Okay, so this is gonna be trees on the top of the mountain. And we're gonna walk our way from here to here. We're gonna be noticing also that there are other types of trees. Maybe they're birch trees, like I said earlier. Okay, and that's going to be a different animal altogether. What we're gonna do is I'm just going to, just like this, get a little crazy with my dots and dashes here just for a minute. And that's going to be what symbolizes those trees. Just like this, their they're branches are bare because it's the winter time, okay? But that's it, that's all I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna go nuts with my detail here. Maybe if you want to add another one of those cedar trees and go ahead, start from the top, walk your way down on either side. I like, I like saying to leave some room for the imagination in this instance, like you don't have to draw every branch on that tree, just enough. And then the brain will do the rest of the work. Okay. And there's a good amount of coverage, even though it's not all evergreen trees. There's a good amount of coverage on this slope here. So that's why I'm not just going to draw a straight line from top to bottom. Look at all the space that exists, okay, in these uh, trees, right? That's, that's what we're calling them with quotes, trees. There's a lot of room here because you get the gradient. That's important. That's the important piece. You understand it's a mountain and it's light and airy. There's room in there. And that is what's going to allow us to interpret this room as, as trees, okay? Now picture this slope over here, okay? That goes all the way to the top of the mountain. Let's walk our way back up there. All I'm gonna do is make my little Richter scale using dots all the way to the top of the mountain. I'm gonna see what the other slopes are doing you know, this, this slope has a little bald patch here, so I'm going to make sure I draw that bald patch. I'm going to make it come up like this and come down like that. And behind it are going to be some little tiny trees growing. Okay, there's a little divot here, almost like you'd see on a sand dune. Okay. I'm just gonna fill that in, maybe a little bit darker than the trees in the foreground too. See what happens when you add a darker layer on top and it's just all broken up. They blend in really nice. It really feels organic there. Okay, and there's a, a sweet bowl that happens to be carved out of here too. Just be careful, don't fill in too much there. You always wanna leave some room for the imagination, like I said, so just consider the the gradient, the slope, how these things are all tied together here. Acknowledge some of the shading. Some gentle lines just like that. Then there's a little spine in here, so this is gonna be brighter. Got some trees growing on the spine. Okay, there's our one little hero tree all by itself standing strong. Okay. All right. Now let's go ahead and see what's happening on this slope. We have another shape here. Got some trees growing on top of that. So I'll use the Richter scale again. 
not so much on this side. So as it comes down, it could just use a regular line, disappears into this tree. Go a nice gentle gradient here. And this forms kind of a valley that travels down like that. So if I was going to make an adjustment, it would be this. Boom, just like that. Okay. And if you feel like your forest is getting a little too busy, hold back. That's okay. You don't have to draw every single tree. It's not the goal. Okay, and we have a smattering of what looks like some small brush up here, just poking through the snow. Just like that. Some other trees up here, wandering up towards the top of the mountain. Yeah, I'm thinking if this mountain has trees that high up, it feels like maybe this was, this is an East Coast mountain. East Coast US rather. There we go, right on the summit too, you have these tiny little trees. Up in New York, we have these mountains called the Adirondacks, and they get so much snow in the winter that even the trail signs get buried. So you got to be a good map reader, a good navigator when you're hiking up there in the winter. And you're walking around in snowshoes, and uh, you're still sinking up to your knees sometimes. That's how deep the snow gets up there. But one really cool feature is as you get towards the summit of some mountains, we have this one mountain called uh, Skylight Mountain. Um, the trees are really small. They probably come up to about your hip. And they have these really, really cool icicles that are growing in the direction which the wind is blowing. So you have these horizontal icicles on these tiny trees. It looks out of this world. So if anybody has any really cool pictures from their winter hikes that have really big icicles growing in weird directions, send them to me via email, I'd love to see him. Any aspiring alpinists out there? Okay, so this is that section of trees that grow right in the middle. And we're walking our way over to the forest again. This is gonna be the hard part. Easiest part's gonna be the reflection. That's gonna be the easiest thing for us to do. That's our easy job. Hard job are these trees. Okay, using Lots and lots of marks, but keeping room in between them, right? Okay, the only places I'm doing solid lines are where it's clearly bare. You know, lots of just flat snow in those spots. Everywhere else, see how there's a lot of white space in between these marks? That's huge. You want to capture that. Okay, so we have the base of these trees here and the tops of smaller ones there. Okay. Don't have to go too crazy there. We could actually just leave that blank pretty much. And just, just to cover ourselves, this is that bottom part of the mountain. You're gonna see a lot of trees, a lot of shorter ones, a lot of bare trees. It's kind of hanging out right at the foot of this mountain maybe a couple of little of those evergreen spruce or cedar trees growing with them. Don't overdo it. Just a little bit, like this is good enough. Just like this. Okay. Enough to capture the point, that's basically it. It's like you're telling a really, really long story. And in order to keep your audience engaged, you just get right to the point as fast as possible without sacrificing the quality of the story. That's sort of what you, what a good metaphor for what we're doing with this landscape is. We're getting to the point. It's an interesting story. We don't want to rush to get there, but we want to get there just fast enough so that our viewer understands it and appreciates it as much as we do.
And if you come from a big Italian family like me, you can't get a word in edgewise anyway. So <laughs> it's good that the stories stay shorter. Okay. So a lot of considerations as we, as we get into the crux of our drawing or the hard part. Okay, so we have our baseline here, leaving a lot of room for imagination. Okay, now we're gonna start our forest. So this is gonna be kind of like a, a layering initiative. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have the trees that are in the foreground and the ones in the foreground are going to have essentially a lot of white space around them. Okay, it's going to be like this archetypical tree here. Okay, so I, I talked about a visual hierarchy earlier. Those are the things that are gonna get the eyes on them first, right? That's what the drawing is about. So there's a couple of key things in here, like the mountains, for example, and some of the trees that are gonna get the eyes first. So that's why we're going to just make sure that there are maybe a handful of trees, and I'll show you how to do that in a second, that have enough white space in them because behind them, it's just gonna get dark and it's, it's going to uh, make them pop out more. So let's make a tree here. I'm gonna put a dot for the top of the tree and a dot for the bottom of the tree. Remember we drew our leaf earlier, we used a similar method. And you could do two dots on the side for how wide you want the tree to be, but it's not necessary. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around the perimeter of the tree. And I'm just noticing how these branches are sort of layered on top of each other, especially because they have so much snow. And it gets heavy after a while. So the trees kind of have to hold that burden up. So that's going to affect their shape. Okay, so this is going to be another tree. Okay. And we're going to leave it totally blank for now, for now, okay? Because behind it, it's going to fill in a lot darker. Okay, and we have some space here. That's good. Let's go ahead and make a edge of a tree that goes behind this one. Okay, we have a little slope of snow here. Just like that. Now, in the areas around the trees, we're going to make it darker. And all I'm doing is just making some dots and dashes to fill in that space because we want the trees out front to pop or, or to come forward. Okay, and we have the tops of those taller trees that are going to be darker. So don't be shy about filling in that a little bit more, but don't let them overlap on top of the trees that are here in the foreground. We want those to be, um, blank for now so that we can add maybe a little bit of detail in there and they'll still pop. Okay, so everything else there, we're just gonna go ahead and fill in. Okay, I have a piece of scrap paper here which is preventing my drawing hand from accidentally smudging everything. Okay, we got a nice little space in here that we can use. For another tree. Remember, you're not trying to draw every tree in the forest. You're just trying to draw a handful of really prominent ones and then use mark making to make it a little bit darker behind them. Okay. And that way, these ones, these will be the, the ones that pop the most. <laughs> Such an artsy term. <laughs> Pops. <laughs> There's, there's a really cool tree here that I want to get to before I fill in too much of the background. And it's interesting to me because there is a, a nice section of trunk that's visible. Um, 
what we have here is a little pillow of snow and it kind of walks around till it gets off the page, like right around here. Okay, so it's got a little path, it walks like this. And then right carved into the side of the mountain, you have a couple of tree trunks. Let's get those in there. They're growing on top of each other, but I'm only concerned about the dominant ones, the thicker ones like this. Okay, I'm not gonna draw them all the way up. I'm just gonna draw where they start. Okay, just like that. So now that we have the bases, we can come in here just like before. Just pay attention to how the branches are growing. Okay, notice how they're kind of curving up a little bit and then they straighten out and then they start, of, start kind of curving downward because of the weight of all that snow maybe, just like that. And we're gonna fill all that stuff in momentarily, but just maybe sneak a little couple of sections of trunk in there. Okay, like this one's pretty obscured by its foliage. But this one here, you, if you look in the reference photo, there's a little, little space, a little window, you can see about this much trunk before it's obscured with more foliage. So that's something you might wanna consider adding in there. Again, this is the hard part, so don't feel bad if you're, if you're having a little bit of trouble right now. A lot of information here. And if it helps, you can darken your trunk a little bit by just on either side, creating these little dashes that travel and, and show you the contour of the, or the roundness of the trunk. That's pretty cool. Use that line weight to suggest shadow. Okay. Working our way up. Okay, and then this pretty much in here is going to be cover, right? But here's where you can enjoy a little bit of power here as the artist. Let's say we have one more tree that's going to have a, a prominent role in this drama here. Not as tall as the other trees, but tall enough. Tall enough to hold its own. She's a hardy one, so the other trees don't pick on her. So there we go. Growing nice and tall. Pretty sure these trees are actually both sexes, unisex. They have uh, both male and female reproductive uh, organs. One of the trees that, one of the plant species that we did um, in our botanical drawing class is uh, a tree that is, uh, they have a male and a female. So if you ever look at a holly bush, right? And there's berries, that's the female. And if, if you see no, no berries at all, that's the male. So I think that's called a dioecious species, meaning uh, two houses, right? If, if a tree is both sexes, it's a monoecious species, meaning one house. So maples, oak trees, things like that. Those are great examples of monoecious species. Most, I believe, most tree species are. Okay, so because this is going to be a hero tree, we don't want it to be filled in all the way, feel free to fill in all the rest of the space. Okay, just using this type of mark making. Don't, don't think about it too much, right? You can basically scribble 
okay, in around these spots, and it'll do the exact same job, right? So that's okay if it if it feels like it's scribble, that's fine. You just want it to be a little bit darker around that tree so that it pops out a little bit more. Just like this. A little bit of trunk there. Whew, okay, hard part's over. Okay, so now I'm just gonna add a couple little shadows there. Okay, so now with the areas of the tree that we didn't fill in, I'm just gonna take this time to add some, just a little bit of marks to it so they don't feel too naked. Just a little bit like that. Okay, and now we have our forest. Okay, now for the rest of this drawing, we're gonna notice how the snow meets the water. Almost like pillows. Okay, I'm going to just sort of follow the line work I did earlier. Just gonna notice how there's a slight bump or um, like a shelf almost that the snow is sitting on top of. Okay, so that's important to note. Okay, especially as it dips in and out of the water like that, you have this nice curve. See the layers, it's almost like a cake. This rounded shape. Okay, so whenever all this snow melts in the springtime, that's why we have a lot of flooding in the wetlands. That's why we have a lot of mosquitoes in Maine. <laughs> Some sunlight in there. Okay. So what about these reflections? So here's the tip. What we can do is just outline very, very vaguely the reflection that we're seeing, right? Especially if it's darker, like here's a tree line. Okay, we're gonna see where the tree line kind of goes. We can flip it upside down if that helps too. Okay, we have this Richter scale. Just like that. And then we hit the tree line here. Okay, we can see the reflection of the mountains. Very vague, you don't have to make it perfect. Okay, top of the mountain there, top of the mountain to you. Okay. And that is essentially how we tackle landscape drawing. So again, we're, we've recorded this, so you can rewatch it later at your leisure. You don't have to feel rushed at all. Okay. Leave your mark. All right, and if you wish, you could also add some shading into your lake, just like this, just some horizontal lines. That'll help to break it up and differentiate what you're seeing. Because you want the snow to be very, well, um, snowy. <laughs> you want it to be brighter or lighter in value. So you can just do a little edge like that. Okay, as the snow, snow banks are reflected in the water too. It's a mirror image, basically. Okay. There we go. OK, 
Okay, we have a nice little winter scene there. So we have about 15 minutes left in class. And what I'd like to do next is play a little game with you. And I'm going to share my screen again here. All right. And this game is sort of like a memory based game. What we're going to do is what we call field sketching. Okay. And in our nature journaling class, what we do is we take on the mentality of a natural history reporter. Okay. So in our landscape drawing, we were thinking like architects. Now we're going to think like reporters. The object of this game is to record as much information as possible using pictures and words. Okay. So this is going to be like a, um, for example, a very loose and, and not, not necessarily pretty picture, but it's going to be packed full of as much information as possible. For example, we have this um, black spruce tree on the left. You know, we're looking at details, like we're seeing what's growing on it, the foliage, we're seeing uh, how tall a person is compared to it. We're going to be looking at different parts of the environment. On the right, we have, um, you know, the type of like a deciduous tree, right, a birch tree, looking at the bark, looking at what's living in the tree, what the leaves look like. That's the concept. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, before we get, before we start, we're going to get ready. Okay. And I'm just going to take my same paper that I have before. Okay. And it's kind of nice how it's starting to become a narrative here. We're going to flip it over to the other side. Okay. And we're going to make a box. We're going to square off our page. Okay. We got about 15 minutes left. So this is going to be, it's going to happen fast. So think about how we've worked on our observation skills this whole class. And we're going to put them to the test. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make a line down the center of my rectangle, vertically and horizontally. So I'm going to wind up with four different boxes or thumbnails. Okay, we're going to think like reporters here. What's the story we're covering? Okay, let's pick a place. Let's say we're hiking. And I saw that we had somebody here from Ireland. So let's say we're hiking in the, I think it's called the Burren. Is that the national park? Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting stone formation. And um, we're, gonna, we're gonna pretend we're all hiking together in Ireland, okay? Is that in Donegal? I'm trying to remember. But anyway, the park is called the Burren. The it's in, uh, Clare on the west coast. That's right. You're spot on. Yeah, it's very karst kind of landscape. A lot of limestone. Yeah. It's really interesting. I stopped there for a sandwich. I was hiking through. <laughs> all right. And we're going to put the date. We're all hiking together. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and consider that, um, okay. I'm going to do a quick one for you just from the top of my head. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself, let's say 15 seconds with a little kitchen timer here, or give me 30 seconds. Okay. Seems like a lot of time, but I just hit go. And in 30 seconds, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm looking out at my imaginary landscape here. And it's kind of flat, except for some slight mountain, some elevation in the end, and it's windy. I'm going to write that down. It's windy and partly cloudy. There are a lot of these holes in the rock, so I'm going to write that down. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of rock, but let's say granite. Time's up. That's 30 seconds. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play for you a, a two different video clips, okay? So we're going to look and we're going to see something up very close. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of things happening. And what I want you to do is as you watch, write down and try to sketch as much as possible, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the video and you're going to have to finish the rest of it from memory. And I'm going to be a little bit more generous with you. This time, instead of 30 seconds, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a full minute 
So you're going to look and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you 15 seconds to look. And then with the rest of that minute, you're going to have to draw down as much as possible what you saw. Okay. So this is the memory game. All righty. So get ready, pick up your pencils, get ready to write notes and draw as much as you possibly can. And then 15 seconds, I'll take, uh, I'll take down the video. Okay, so we're walking along and we see um, a, a, a plant that's still growing. It's still green, but it's got some stuff growing on it. And then we take a closer look and we see that there are these tiny little aphids. So you have 10 seconds, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, what did you see? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna start the clock. We have a minute to draw. I'm gonna share my top-down camera with you. Um, I said uh, we were hiking and spotted, I guess these are aphids, A-P-H-I-D-S on plant. So that's the text, okay? That's, we got 40 seconds left. What do these things look like? Well, I kind of saw that they had a, a tiny little shape. Obviously they have six, uh, like a spade shape. They have six legs with these antennas and they're crawling all over each other. So these are going to be aphids. And what are they doing? Are they eating? How many? I'm just gonna put lots. <laughs> um, and they're, they're on this branch here. Ah, we got five seconds left. Little hairs on the branch. And that's it, time's up, pencils down. Okay. So again, we're thinking like natural history reporters and I'm trying to document as much as possible, right? So what we're going to do is take another look at that video and break down some of the little points that we can consider before we do our next one. So what did you see? Okay. So I had some questions, like what are they doing? Are they laying eggs? What do the green spots on their backs mean? What are they eating specifically? What attracts them to the plant? How many of them are there? These are all the questions that just ran through my head within a few seconds of looking at these little guys. Okay, and that's kind of why I like carrying a little field lens with me too. Um, truth be told, I had these things growing on a radish plant and that's what made me interested in them to begin with. But they kind of have like a cricket-like shape to their body. And I think the marks are quite beautiful. It almost looks like a velvet type of material. They don't gross me out at all. Uh, and I'm looking and I'm seeing these little hairs growing on the plant, okay? So, that's the object of this game is to get as much information down on the paper as possible. So let's go ahead and quickly reset ourselves. Let's go ahead and pick up our pencils again. And I'm going to show you something different on a much larger scale. And I didn't see these animals in the burn, but let's just still pretend that we're there. And I'm going to play the video. You're going to have another uh, full minute, or let's give you two minutes. I'm going to give you a full two minutes after I play the video for 15 seconds, okay? We'll begin in three, two, one, now. Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Okay, what kind of trees are you seeing? What what are the how many mule deer were there? Okay, I'll play it for you one more time. Okay, looks like there is a baby. Okay, next to mom and dad. Remember, these deer don't have antlers all year round. The males grow them in the rutting season, and then lose them. Okay, so. How are we gonna sketch this out? Let's go ahead and do it together. Okay, what I saw were, okay, and I'm gonna start two minutes on the clock. Group of mule, M-U-L-E, deer. Okay, so we had big pointy ears. Okay, 
And you could totally be cartoony with the way the drawing comes out. That's fine. This is note taking. We have a baby. Probably just born that spring. It's its first winter. Okay. Then we have the big buck. The tail. We have some in the trees. Kind of maybe this is like a, a type of sage brush. Okay. We have some of those pine trees or uh, evergreen type trees. Another question you could ask, like exactly the same thing with the bugs. What are they eating? Okay, these are all your, this is like a map of your thoughts so that when you get back home, after your hike, you can sit down and try to answer those questions. Maybe ask a, a park ranger on your way out or uh, somebody who knows more about these animals than you do. Okay. Long eyelashes, that's another thing I noticed. These are brown. Okay, and that's it. So within two minutes, we got a little snapshot of something that happened in life, okay? Now, when you combine all of these little snapshots together, let's say, for example, we're walking along and we see a, uh, a bird, like uh, let's say, for example, it's doing something interesting, like it's dropping a rock. Maybe this is a crow, okay, or a raven. Let's make it a raven. I love ravens. Okay, let's say we have a raven here, okay? Very character caricature-esque, we don't have to make it a perfect raven, okay? And it's doing something interesting. It's dropping a rock on top of a, a clam or a snail or something like that. Let's make it a snail. Okay, so let's say snail and it's dropping what looks like a, a rock on top of the snail shell. And we could even write it down. And what we're doing is we're, we're now, we're, we're not only just looking out for wildlife, but we're, we're asking the questions, what is it doing? Well, it's being very intelligent and it's using a rock as a simple tool to smash open a snail and you can look and maybe when the, when the bird flies away, what other kinds of shells are you seeing? Maybe you're seeing clam shells or you're seeing um, other things like maybe there's some type of um, material that it's attracted to or, or better tools, different tools. Right. And what we have now is let's say about 10 minutes worth of drawing and note taking. Okay, that's all tied together by these two data points, right? We have the date, we have the location, we have these little stories that are happening here. And we could even add, you know, we have our weather. Okay, it's windy, partly cloudy. Temperatures are kind of cool. And if you do enough of these, let's say, for example, you do have a nature journal, you kind of have a narrative that unites your entire experience and puts a little bit more than just a couple of questions down on paper. You have some visual notes as well. So over the course of this class, we learned a little bit about how to draw with our system, our, our, our architecture kind of system with our nature object here. And we saw how data played a point in this as well, measurements and such. We did some technique working on drawing in our landscape building our trees, constructing our drawing uh, systematically. And then we went for an imaginary hike together to the burn in Ireland, and we saw some really interesting things on our hike, okay? So have some announcements to make really quick before we close. Okay, and here we have our family of deer. Yes, we saw you already. Thank you very much. 
I want you to take everything you've learned and keep running with it. Okay, this is a this is a practice that is meant to be done outside. Obviously, we're all from different parts of the world. I would love to take you on a real hike in person, but since I can't take you on a hike, you're going to have to take yourself out on a hike. And I recommend making that uh, either hiking or nature meditation or time outside uh, a part of your weekly or daily routine. If there are certain things that you're very inspired by, read up on them, become a, a subject matter expert in that area. I'd love to meet more people who know more about plants and insects and things like that. And it puts you in a great position, not only to learn, but to teach people what you've learned. And a great place to keep all that information is a nature journal. So if you're interested, we also have a nice group of nature loving artists, just like yourselves on Facebook, go to facebook.com slash groups slash hike and draw. And not only is it a great forum for discussion, a great place to share your work. It's also a place where I offer discounts to workshops. People get uh, first dibs. If I come out with a new workshop, they'll find out about it first. I also offer a, another, um, uh, type of experience, which is a monthly social that's free. We all get together and draw together for fun. And, uh, and there's a whole lot more. It's a lot of value in joining that work, that group. So I encourage you to do so. If you're interested, I have some recommended reading for you. You can click on these links when I email you this lesson packet. These are some of the books that I've read over the past couple of months, and I've very, very much enjoyed them. I'm currently reading Cosmos by Carl Sagan, uh, inspired by that, uh, that alignment of J Jupiter and Saturn that was pretty cool to see in the sky in December. Um, also, these are some additional resources for you. I've also linked these as well. These are some different, uh, different ways to enhance your nature experiences. And you can go ahead and read through this and explore that later. So this is for all your smartphone users there. Um, this is our workshop schedule for January. We have our next class, which is a nature drawing class in partnership with the Dedham Library of Massachusetts. We're going to be, that's a donation-based event. So we're gonna be uh, sharing the revenue with, a, with a, a local food pantry up there. We have a new anthropomorphic character design class featuring uh, my friend Connor Nolan, who's the other hike and draw instructor. That's a class that helps you to create imaginary characters, especially if you're into um, things like, uh, like game design or, uh, or storybook design to design characters based on nature. Uh, we have our community live draw, botanical drawing. We have a compass class for those hikers out there if you wanna get better at your compass. And finally, we end the month with our landscape drawing intro class. That's a lot to get through, but that's that. If you enjoyed today's class, feel free to please leave a tip. Um, my Venmo handle is at J-S-I-S-T-I-1. And we have so much more to offer. We have a lot of great classes coming up. So I hope you join us for any number of them. It was an absolute pleasure spending this time with you today. I am uh, very pleased with the turnout for today. I hope you come back. And uh, thank you all so much. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Happy You're New welcome. Year. Thank you. Happy